How are you going, guys? Um, very good from all three of you. Uh, my name's Hugh Reed and I'm a farmer. Um, there's a question for Nicholas, and just around the, the indoor vertical farming model, like <clears throat> something that I've heard, and, and I'm an outdoor farmer and, and limited experience in hydroponics, so if you go outdoor farming where you get all environments, and then you've got hydroponics, which is semi-controlled, so, and then indoor farming's the next sort of evolution that, that where it's completely controlled. What, what I've been told is that the, the plants lack conditioning, they lack muscle, and, and then that leads to poor sh shelf life. You know, so, so you've got limited um, opportunity to sell it or you need to be close to market, which is one of the advantages of, of um, vertical farming. But I was just wondering whether that's true because, yeah. And look. Uh, to, to be sure that I got your question. So uh, how to be close to the market? No. no, no, the question is, is that uh, I believe the biggest problem in vertical farming is the plants lack, lack condition. They lack environmental stress, which is, which, um, is leads to poor shelf life. Um, is, that, is that true? And, and from my experience, I would say that is true. I can give, uh, I've visited a lot of these uh, vertical farming companies when I've been traveling. Because they're using LED lighting and different light spectrums, they actually remove that problem. That was one of the teething problems to start with. So I, what I see is they're a lot more robust and it depends on what crop you talk about, right? And some lettuce tops is more difficult than others. But they're, what they're doing is really smartly using LED technology or lighting technology to actually improve that robustness um, of product. Because if you, just for an example, if you go to field ground cause, I'm not sure if everybody would agree with me, yeah. field ground cause versus a head to head with a hydroponic cause, um, on a shelf life uh, you know, point of view, um, the, the field ground cause grown well would, would be better, but obviously the hydroponics, the consistency and all that time over, if you've got difficult field growing conditions, yeah. the, the hydroponics wins out. So That's the balance, right? The other thing too is might be interesting, and I, I don't know, but I mean, I presume that we're, if the agricultural system changes, then there'll be a driver for breeders to look at developing plants to suit that agricultural system. So if we've got an expansion of indoor agriculture, one form or another, or these vertical systems, perhaps we're going to be breeding varieties of plants to suit those systems. And so we'll get that link between the variety and the agronomic practice sort of thing. And what we see now is a lot of, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to travel around several places and meet several growers, where we've got problems with land, with nematodes and everything else. They're actually putting hydroponic systems on top of the soil outdoor, and they're also seeing a lot of efficiencies because they can actually turn crop cycles more quickly. And that's one of the biggest advantages with hydroponic lettuce, for example, is that you can turn 12 cycles per year in the same space. When open field, you're doing what, one, two, three crops probably, if you're lucky, depends on the, the, the area you're growing. So that efficiency is even at that level just by adopting that hydroponics and putting it on top of your soil. So there's different ways, and, and I see a lot of people combining vertical farming, urban farming. That's really a space that everybody's talking about. Um, but if you look at the, the industry in a whole, labor is the biggest concern everybody has in this room, I think, right? And if, if I see everybody I talk to, it's 50% in general of the total production costs. So if you put it all together, you know, if you go to box farming, again, it's really difficult to automate. Vertically, it's difficult to automate. So, you know, it's where, where is that balance in them systems and how you combine them to be more efficient? Also, if I may add something, uh, I think there is a misconception that indoor farming, well, you should choose between indoor farming and conventional farming. Well, you can actually combine them by uh, using, for example, a container to produce microgreens during most part of the year. and whenever you have, I don't know, droughts or floods and you need to somehow catch up for your season, you can produce seedlings quickly in a controlled environment where you light, uh, you know, 18 hours a day and have faster cycles to uh, produce seedlings. So that's also something we're looking into. Yeah. It's utilizing the toolbox, right? Hello, yeah, Jeff Farm from Central New South Wales. Look, a lot of the crops we grow now, like beans, peas, corn and that, are all uniform harvest, right? How do we get some of the other plants to come on to get that uniformity? I mean, is it genetically within the plant that they have a multiple maturity rate for their relongation for propagation of seed within that plant? Or do they try and you know, mash produce like corn where it's already on one day? 
can we actually breed that into the plant to make broccoli and cauliflower easier to harvest? No, it's, it's, it's part of the breeding toolbox. So if you look at double haploid technology, you look at the CRISPR technology, it's utilizing all of them things. If you do double haploid and CMS technology, that gives you 100% genetic uniformity. So it's how you combine the toolbox. You know, just normal breeding is about selection. If you look at the tools that some of our breeders are working with now, they can have 2,000 plots, but because of the markers and the, the chipping technology they use, they can go to exactly the right plot at the right time. So they're, they're more, more predictive in selection. Rather than by visual eye, they actually have the tools in the background to help them do that with markers and different things. So that technology is, and we're not just the only ones using it, you know, Nunnams and all them guys are also using that technology. I think another factor of that variability, Jeff, is about what, what's in your land yep. and, and how you map perhaps your paddocks, your fields, and then what you can do to actually make those fields more uniform, <coughs> whether you look at variable fertiliser treatment, variable planting rates, variable a whole range of other things. But that comes all back to collecting the data and using that data to improve your system, whatever, whatever case that may be. But that could be one of the elements you might be worthwhile considering. Other questions? A, a question for Eric. You, you briefly mentioned IF2020, and uh, that's a program over there, is it? Could you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, well, IOF2020 is a European program. Uh, it runs 19 use cases on Internet of Things uh, in all different sectors, so in the vegetable, in the fruits, in the uh, meat, uh, so all uh, agricultural uh, businesses. And also through the whole value chain. So there are use cases that are more uh, at the field. So the one I showed on, on weeding. And there are more active in the collaboration between farmers. And there are more cases, uh, more into the value chain up to a retailer or something like that. So they, they identified uh, these use cases to have a broad spread in, in the agricultural domain. So that, that's, that's, that's one X, and, and on the other X, you have a technology X, where technology providers are that are making IoT, IoT systems, uh, coming in most cases from other businesses, uh, try to learn all the use cases from agriculture, how, how it works, how you can uh, have safe data. Uh, for example, we had to do a stride analysis to have a, 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 yeah, a safe data value chain. It was completely new for us. Uh, but we learned a lot from it. So it's very good that also the other industry is in interfering in, in our projects. Um, it's called technical support, the access, and there is a business support as well. Well, okay, now we have data, and how uh, are we making use of the data? And uh, the approach, what I very like, and, uh, and it, it's also very good for uh, precision horticulture and IoT is looking for the minimal viable pro product. Yeah, so it's not new. But um, doing it in the right way in these kind of projects, is, it's, it's very powerful to have in one year a solution which works and has a commercial interest. You don't gain very much money. It's not a big win probably, but that then you can start building on that and add new functionality and, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, to have a, a successful IoT solution. Um, and yeah, these access so technology, business, and the agricultural domain that will come together in that whole program. Uh, we have a yearly event where we share everything. We have a platform. You can watch the website, IOF 2020, uh, what it's exactly uh, there. So it could be interesting uh, because it's for, for many people it's quite new and uh, this is quite handy. Uh, it's still run a lot from, from out of research, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's interesting. One last question, if I can, but, but, but Byron, please. Eric, it was uh, Byron from Horde Innovation. It was great to see that broccoli harvester and even that you wouldn't show us the video because it's close to commercialization. So um, my question is, how soon will we be able to order an automatic broccoli harvester at an event like this? How far away are we? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it will be a four-row uh, selective harvester. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and we will test it uh, even this season uh, with a full prototype, but it will, will take a year from that, from October on. Then you will find it in uh, the first sh show, probably. Yeah. One and a half year, take one and a half year. It's not a big promise, but... Uh, that was a very clear answer, wasn't it? Yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, On that note, look, we're just going to have a quiet break, a quick break now, probably about 15 minutes.